some conversations will be mind-blowing and you'll sit there and you'll have the most profound change. Welcome to 52 Conversations. This is Janice Howe, the host, and we are here to converse, commune and connect. And actually, I believe that when we converse, it creates change. So I'm really honoured to have my guest with me today on this conversation is Brenda Lee Brown. And she is very luckily over in Antigua right now. So welcome, welcome to the conversation, Brenda. Thank you, Janice. It's great to speak to you face to face after a long time. I know. It's been, it's been a while, hasn't it? It's been a so while. This, ho this whole thing that the world is, is I don't want to say suffering from, yeah. Living, living through, existing living through, through is, is causing so much disruption in so many ways. Um, and one of the things that definitely came out of that for me was the power of conversation. So if, I, if I'm being really glib, for the last 10, 11, 12 years, if people say, what do I do? And I'm like, I just have conversations with people. And sometimes it changes their mind in multiple ways. And sometimes it's just one way. There's always a change. Um, so the value of conversation is huge. So if we were on my radio show, the way that I used to do it was asking the person to introduce themselves as who they think they are today. And I'm not sure how I feel about that conversation opening. Mm. So I just want you to introduce yourself to the audience. I know there will be people listening that know you. And I know there's people who will be listening to you for the first time. So I'm just going to pass it over to you. You're Brenda and you are? Um, I'm a writer, teacher, mother, friend, daughter, um, story collector, visually and orally. I'm a writer who believes that stories, conversations are stories and visualize visuals, sunset, sunrise, buildings, Treat, whatever there, there's there's stories so I collect stories I'm a collector it took me a long time to realize that's what I do I I collect stories okay so, so that's that's a really great place to start though so what had to happen for you to realize that you were the collector of stories and then the sharer of stories uh 50 <laughs> <laughs> turn 50 um I've always wanted to be a writer since I was eight nine but if you don't know, I'm, I'm a black British Caribbean heritage. So when I was going to school in the 1960s, I didn't see, and up, to, up to my teenage years, I didn't see writers that looked like me. I did Dickens and Bronte, and I, and I love Dickens, I love Bronte, and Hardy and blah, blah, blah. So I didn't know that people like me were writing until I was about 15. And my cousin um, was working in the black community and she met Jessica and Erica, Eric Huntley, who owned Bougalouverture, which is one of the most uh, well-known African-Caribbean bookshops at that time, up to now, since the 60s, 70s. And right. she introduced me to that shop, and I saw books that looked like me. Yeah, and I, looked, and I was like, oh, we have stories to tell. But again, I still wasn't quite convinced that I could tell. So I would yeah. listen to stuff, yeah. I would listen to stuff So we collect it. Was it as clear as what you just said, though, that you walked into the shop and thought they looked like me? Yeah, because I was stunned. I was stunned to see, you know, and I say look like me. I mean, they're mainly men. It's Samuel Selvon and uh, or George Lamming, V.S. Naipaul. And it was just like, oh, my gosh, these are the things that my parents talked about. Mm -hmm. But they're actually in a book, you know, and, and it's and. Um, I then, I then read a book, and I cannot remember the lady's name, and, uh, it was a black woman, and she wrote a book about a young boy coming from the Caribbean to England, well, at the time it was called the West Indies, to England. Right. Yeah. And I remember the one line I remember is that he had been bullied, and his mother gave him a cup of hot, sweet tea. And I was just like, what? Because yeah. it never occurred to me that... Yeah. Some of my age, I, I, I was, I was, I was, yeah, the word is oblivious because I was never told I was, my parents didn't tell me I was black. My parents didn't tell me I was other. We just 
were. Yeah. Went to school, ate fish and chips, played in the park. And at 11, I became black. I became aware of my otherness at age 11 at secondary school. So, so at that point, you were just Brenda. I was just Brenda. Black. My parents, the fact that my parents talked about Antigua, which is a place I couldn't even identify. Um, yeah. But we ate rice and peas on a Sunday. We ate saltfish. And the, when my mother could get Caribbean food, that's what we ate. Yeah. But in school, I ate the fish and chips and the peas, whatever, whatever was, you know, spotty yeah. dick, whatever was school dinner. So it never occurred that we were different. Right. So, and we, my father played music every Saturday. And once a month, family and friends would come over and they'd gather on a Saturday and play music and cook. And it was just normal. It didn't occur to me that this made us different. And then when you became conscious of things like, the, I would say, the white kids talking about tea, tea time. You're like, well, what the hell's tea time? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> and then getting jealous that they were having beans on toast. Like, how oh, come we can't have beans on toast? <laughs> no, we got to have rice and we got to have, but, you know, we were just kids. But 11, it became quite clear, clear that we were different so, and so treated differently. So do you think that was kind of an introduction to your ancestral heritage right there? That you weren't necessarily known to be that for what it was? Um, I then became aware that the stories I was listening to and trying very hard to ignore yeah. actually had relevance and actually helped to define who we were at that time. This is like the early yeah. 70s. Right, that, so that was yeah. running through that was running through your veins, whether you knew it or not. Whether we knew it or not, and my father, I I, I credit him. Even though we had a difficult relationship, I credit him because uh, he told these stories endlessly, and we were like, "Oh my God, here we go again!" No. <laughs> but yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad because it helped. It really helped to to define, especially when the turbulent seventies came and we became of age, we became teenagers. Yeah. That became very important, very important. So, so, so there were some big lessons in that coming of age, I guess. From what oh, gosh, yeah. Um, shocking I, lessons or just like, whoa, where'd that come from? Kind of no, like? shocking, shocking. I mean, and it, did, it took us a long time to process. We didn't, we weren't even aware. I, I'll give a, I, I tell this story before, but, you know, at age 11, I went to secondary school. I was an A student. And at my secondary school, it's a comprehensive, but the Mrs. Brown, her name was coincidentally, she uh, ran it like a grammar school. So we did Latin, music, I mean, proper old school, yeah. uniform. I mean, we were, and uh, I was an A student. Quiet, I'm, I'm an introvert by, by nature, which I know now, I didn't know then. Yeah. So I was very quiet and uh, A student. And this lady came, there was five of us in this a class because each class is streamed and there's five girls of Caribbean heritage in this A set. Never thought about it. And this lady came for us a day, took us into this room. And I remember the room was very bright, very sunny. Yeah. And there was a world map on the wall that I was facing. And I'm, I'm paying absolutely no attention because <laughs> I thought, oh, missing the lesson. Yay! <laughs> you know, we're going to have fun. And then she did this thing about write your, write your write about your home life, write a little piece. I'm like, oh, I go to the park, I watch Thunderbirds. Da, 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 da. And uh, then she started doing this oral test where she said to us, where are we from? Right. I live in East London, I'm from Leighton. No, no, where were you born? North London, Islington. <laughs> right. yeah. And then she, come, she came back again with where are you from? And, the, and we were all like, is this a trick question? What, what, do you, you know, what is she? <laughs> And then she finally said, where are your parents from? And we all went, ah, oh, miss, they're from the West Indies, isn't it? And it goes, where about? Antigua, Trinidad, I think Antigua, Jamaica, Gren Dominica, and Grenada. I never, and she said, show me on the map. It was Jamaica, Hispaniola, Haiti, Cuba, not even Haiti, Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, Trinidad, British Guyana, and I think maybe Trinidad, maybe Barbados, maybe. And she said, whereabouts is Antigua? And it was like, uh, West Indies, miss. And I didn't know. 
it was, wasn't named. It was like, hmm? And we found out years later that had we failed that test, she had the power to remove us and put us in a lower grade. Wow. Just based on that. We also found out that they had the school files that our parents at that time were never, were never shown. And on it was your gender and your ethnicity. So when I left my junior secondary school as an A student, I get to senior high and I'm placed in the CSC class and not the O-level class. And my, one of my teachers said, uh, why are you in this class? And the head of the year had told me there was no room for me in the O-level class. And really, and and that, that was it. That was it. Piece of information based on my being Caribbean, yeah, the bias. being West Indian. Full stop. No, no other, no other reason. It's insane, isn't it, to think that? Yeah, it was. It well, you see, because you're living in it. Yeah. And that was, and I said, that's when we became. I became aware at eleven. So by the time I was thirteen, fourteen. We were too black to die. We were going back to Africa. We were, going, we were semi-quasi Rastafarian. We didn't really know what Rastafarians were, but we liked right. the idea. So we became very Africa, pro-African, wrote all kinds of, you know, pro-African slogans on our books. And we created our version of dialect. And it's a very black British voice, especially an urban voice, that now everyone sounds like. But when I was at school, it was very distinct. And yeah. now we know it's a mix of, all our Caribbean heritages, plus being from East London or North London, where we come from, mixed. So it became a specific sound, a black British sound. And we used it, especially when teachers were, were like, Cha, and da, 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 our version of, of dialect. And they would tell us, speak English. Don't speak in that funny language. Well, did that very much become an identity then? Huge, huge. The way we spoke, the way we dressed, the music we listened to, was all, all part of who we saw ourselves. We weren't our parents. We were very clear about that. You know, our parents came from somewhere over there. Yeah. We're from here, but we've got Africa. We, we had African roots before we had West Indian roots. We were that, so you're, you're we were that. Yeah, we were rooted. We thought we were rooted. Yeah. And uh, this is like, like I said, this is the seventies. Yeah. And music. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick on that. You thought mm. you were rooted. What made you realise, or when did you realise then that you weren't rooted? When I got to PC, uh, Politics of Central London to study journalism, and I met people, and I was like, oh, they've read some stuff I've never heard of. Oh, right. It's not enough just to say you think you're African. You don't even know, <laughs> you know that Africa is made up of many countries, many, many religions, many cultures, many, 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 many. It's not a, it's not a place, it's the United, United States of Africa. Yeah. And that so, was like, oh, you need to so learn. that started another education. Another education. To sit along with the education that you thought you were going to get. Yeah, had to, had to, because it was a, I got into, I, 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 after being told I couldn't be a journalist by my careers teacher at school, I, uh, and, um, Sorry, you were told that based on, on your ethnicity and your colour? Purely, purely. Yeah. It had nothing to do with my education, ability. Every black child that went into Mr Lewis, I don't know which part of hell he is, but, you know, Mr Lewis told every single black child a different career. You went in one thing and you came out like, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, I did that. And I was, so I, I went to college to do A-levels and... Became, I got caught up in being black more than being educated. And I'm finding that what we're learning was, yeah, it's great, but we're people too. We're, where's our history? Where's our story? Where's our... And they used to have a movie, a Wednesday movie session at college. And they showed, of all the films to show, Mandingo, which is the most cruel... Horrific came insulting. to my mind. Insulting. Insulting. We were insulted to the max. And again, in this college, we were a minority. All right. But at that that Wednesday, they heard us. Right. We protested and said, What the heck are you showing this for? Yeah. This is this is not our story. Because you know, we'd watch Roots, so we knew our story from Roots, <laughs> you know. So we were become no 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 and we had a sit-in. I mean that was my first ever political act was, was at college because of this film. 
And we were told it's just the film. And it was like, oh, and, and that's when the real wider realization was like, hey, you know, we, we, and then meeting Jessica and Eric Huntley and going to their bookshop and seeing CLR James and VS Naipaul and thinking, huh? You know, there, there are intellectuals amongst us that discussing race at that, for me at that time was about my skin color and yeah. it became political. Yeah. We had the sus laws, guys my age were being picked up for no reason by the police just because they were black on the suspicion of about to commit a crime yeah. because of their skin color. You know, so those, those things were the 70s, you know, and that's when you became really aware. And by the time I got to PCL on a black course, a course for black journalists, then it really like ramped up, yeah. really ramped it's, up. I, I was, and, then I was, it, and then you became. Sorry, I was, sat, I was sat here and I was just feeling this kind of weightiness because I was thinking what's really changed? Because yeah, Nothing. absolutely. Nothing. It's kind of like, you know, we're, we're still in the same storybook, right? We're still in the same storybook because for me, it's, it's, we're still not human. We're athletes, we're, 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 we're so stylish and aggressive and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, actually, we bleed, we cry, we're greedy, we're, we're not so nice, we can be very, you know, we're just like you. Absolutely. <laughs> we're just we're, like you. We're, we're all just human. But not, be, not to be recognised as that and still having to have the conversation with my son and my nephews, you know, about protect yourself, be aware, know that, know where you are, know your rights, you know, to, to, to you know, the, I think what the shock for me was that we thought, my generation thought that we were at the beginning of the change. Right. Uh, There's lots of marches, lots of instances. There was the new crossfire, which was the arson attack, which to this day has never been solved. Colin Roach committed suicide at Stock Newton police station and with a gunshot to the back of his head, how yeah. you do that, we don't know. You know, there was Sherry Gross, there was Stoke New, you know, Tottenham, Brixton, and on and on. And yet, on the flip side, we were create, we had this, we created this culture, this culture that was becoming, was so popular and crossed over. So by the time Jazzy B and his collective came up, we thought we'd arrived. Yeah. Our music was everywhere, our clothes, the way we spoke, we were create people wanted to look like us talk like us and we yeah. thought we were, we were breaking into or easing into the media banking solicitors we were easing into i wouldn't say breaking in so we thought that our generation was knocking it we were like, yeah we're, we're doing it we're doing the thing you know we, the cult of culture we, we, we <laughs> you know it we we did a thing and they always found ways to to, to shut the door and make it slightly harder for us and just and you and you're forever having to explain yourself forever having to watch the i i tell my i tell people now the thing with racism in britain is not that i'm called a name i have never been called a name right the n-word the w word never what i have experienced is the slight eyebrows raise yeah the looks the slight the shift in the subtle shift in the face. I said, that is far more cutting than you calling me a name because you have already dismissed me with that look. I remember going for a job, a, 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 a summer job. It was like a, 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 yeah, like a summer job at the, for the civil service. And um, I was qualified enough to be a, a clerical officer Right. But the only position I was offered was clerical assistant. And right. I thought, hey, it's a temporary job. I don't really care. Good yeah. money. Da, da, da. And one of the questions that was asked was, what do I feel about the royal family? I'm thinking, what the hell that got to do with being a clerical assistant? Yeah, what's, what's that about? And I was like, that's wonderful. They're what, they do such great things for our, con for our country. And they our, and I made an hour for the whole Thing. I was like, why are you asking me about that? What, what have I got to do with filing? <laughs> you know? And I got the job and my C, my clerical officer, the head of my department said, 
you're not even supposed to be in this position. No way, it's temporary, mate. This ain't my future life. <laughs> so I'm not taking it on. But it's those things. It's those things. And those are the things that I tell people, especially in Antigua, where they talk about if I was, you know, if you was, you would not actually, most of you would fall into line and don't even realize that you're falling into line. Absolutely. Right. I, th I, think it's so. I think it's interesting that you say that because there's a definite difference between yourself and I'm going to call an Antiguan that's really only ever been in Antigua and knows that way of life, right? It's completely different. Yeah, they, they, I mean, when I came here first uh, as a, I came here when I was four, so I have very little memory of just things. And But when I came back when I was 20, that was the very first thing that I was stunned at. I walked into a bank, it was a Barclays bank at the time, right. and all the tellers were black. Yeah. My brain was just like, huh? This is <laughs> a bank? Okay. And then I started to meet people, and I was like, they're a lawyer. We mean they're a lawyer. They're a banker. We mean I'm sure there were black people doing that in Britain at the time, but I was not privy to those people. It wasn't normalized like it is now. It wasn't, right? normalized. It wasn't normalized. So it was it was a it was such a shock. It's like, oh my God. And then to hear a white Antiguan speak dialect blew yeah. my mind. Because I was like, oh. There's white people that sound like that. <laughs> and it turned out that the person I was steering at is, a, is John Fuller QC. <laughs> he was a lawyer at the barrister. Yeah, yeah. And he saw me and he goes, you all right? I was like, uh, yes. <laughs> and he started to laugh because he realized why I was steering. And he yeah. just started laughing. And we, we became high buddies from that day to this. I was, hi, how you doing? Because I was just so gobsmacked because I never heard that part of the story. Because no. I knew my parents from the country, so I knew the countryside. I didn't really know the town story. No. My grandmother was a maid in town, and she always referred to white people as Bakra. But I never realized that white people were born and living here as well. So I was just like, oh, <laughs> all the pieces. It was, I, I tell you, it was, it was a... Uh, but then it took me, when I got back to England, I couldn't settle. I couldn't, I didn't like England anymore. I didn't want to be there. I didn't so, want to be... So I remember when we were walking... Well, space. You came, for, you came for a walk with me the other week or the other month, the other month of whenever Couple it was. Yeah, yeah. We went on our amazing walk and I remember you sort of saying the first time you came here, like there was too much space and what are you supposed to do? And it's like now you wouldn't want to be really anywhere else other than in the space that is literally home Antigua, right? Yeah, I, I feel that um, it took me a long time to get there because when I first came, I was having fun. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> I was just like, it's so free. Oh, my God. Uh, you can drink on the streets. We mean, <laughs> you can lime all night, all day. You mean leave work and what? No, nope, you know, you, it, it was simple. Antigua was a lot simpler in the 80s. Yeah. And I met these incredible young men and we're friends to this day. And they were fresh out of university. So that was the first like, huh? Yeah. These guys... Fresh at university, lawyer, doctor, accountant, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, whoa. But we were on the block chatting, liming in carnival, going, you know, to, 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 to Watu in Otters. They introduced me to a side of Antigua and just like, but these are supposed to be professional people, <laughs> you know, but we could sit on the block and, and it was, it was mind blowing. Absolutely. And I was like, yeah. They are so secure in themselves. They are so sure of who they are. And they did not, most of them did not come from um, families with money. Their families just worked damn hard to get an education. Yeah. And it was like, and then I met someone whose father was a minister of government. And it was so normal. The relate, the, 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 I was like, oh, this is just like, this is, this is how it is. So I, I yeah, I bought, I bought into that. Yeah, I had issues and I didn't, I wasn't Antiguan, and that, was, that took me a long time to can yeah. understand about myself. I saw myself as Antiguan because in England, I was a West Indian. Yeah. When I got here, I was Black British. Yeah. And I fought against that for a long time. But I, I, I credit the late Tim, Leonard Tim Hector, for, for easing the, the point in my head and saying, hey, this is what you are. It's all right. But you can yeah. connect to this, but you've got you to recognize 
And once I recognized that this is what I am, Black, British, of Caribbean heritage, I'm good. I don't, you have the problem, mate. I, I'm fine. Yeah, but I have... refuse now to explain myself. <laughs> I don't explain myself anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. I've, I've, got to, I've got to bring you to the point of the book. Sorry. <laughs> the book, the book and, and the passion clearly for words and the passion for music. Yeah, I, um, London Rocks, yeah, that, that was a book. Really, I was having a conversation with my son <laughs> to tell him, you know what, I wasn't born this old. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was a time in my life when I knew these people and it was meant to be, I've said it, you know, it meant to be the story of the girl and her discovering this, 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 this thing. But it became the guy's story because I realised that we didn't often hear our, our men speaking in public and in stories, especially guys of my generation. Yeah. So there's the, there's the Windrush, which is my parents, right? And, but my, my generation, this, this, this one's born in the 60s or arrived in the 60s, who came of age in the late 60s, 70s. You know, we, we, were, we had a story. And, that's, and that is, I put down um, a conversation with Dante, who is the main character. And him, yeah. he, he ended up telling me, and I realized at the end of it, just how important the music and that space was for us, because there we were free. Because we, we created it. Space, that was your space to be. That was, yeah, that was our space to be, right? yeah. yeah and, to be, and to be, and, and to be recognized. And, and you know, and I, I tell people here, I know for a fact that I went to many parties and never saw a white face. You would never know you were in London because it, it was a, and if you did see a white face, it was either she was dating a black guy or it was a, a white guy who was very cool and gone up with some black friends, yeah. but rare, 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 rare. But it, and it wasn't like we didn't say you couldn't come. It wasn't yeah. like there was a big sign saying no whites allowed. You know, we didn't no. have that sign. No. It's just that I think people were not sure of what the music was, who we were, and the dark. It was dark. We we didn't have lights. You know, it was all dark. <laughs> Right, it was, you know, it was dark, and you dressed a certain way. You spoke, you know, that. So, yeah, there was no, there was no sign. But I think people were weary. Yeah, yeah. Of of what it, what this grouping was, mm. you know, you know, guy, and we, you know, the, the barber shops. That became a thing because the guys had to go somewhere to look smart, and the barber shop was the first port of call. Yeah, you know. So yeah, so it wasn't. Yeah, I'm not conscious of us saying, I know whites are loud, but if a white person did turn up, we did like, hmm. You get a raised eyebrow, right? They get the rise, they get the eyebrow. <laughs> They'd get the eyebrow. <laughs> so I guess, I mean, that, that was all part of creating and, and stepping into your real identities, right? Yeah, it, like, and I, 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 yeah. We didn't know. We, we were, we were, and we're still creating. And I think that was the, because we did not vocalise it. It wasn't named, we just did it. Yeah. The way we dressed, the way we spoke, the, the music we listened to, the stuff we started to do, we were just doing and responding. And then the writing, that came because, as uh, I think it's Toni Morrison that said, write, if you don't see the story, write the story you want to read. I, said, I started and you know, being told, write what you know. I yeah. mean, I know now that that doesn't mean literally what you know knows, what you no. find out, what, you, what you're passionate about. Yeah. But I think the first book I wrote had to be that book because I had to tell, get that story out get first. Story out. Yeah. yeah. So, so from writing the book to today, what's that journey, what's that journey been like? What's, um, the, what's the gifts that it's given you, I guess? I mean, I've been on one of your workshops and you're absolutely inspirational. Thank and then, you. Yeah, you know, we're there. We're in the space, and then we go away and kick ourselves because we're not doing what we think we should be doing, and we're still writing. You know, like me, I'm always doodling. I'm always writing something, and I guess it's just how do we harness some of that? I mean, what's your journey been with keeping that connectivity with getting your words down, your words out, and sharing? Well, truth be told, um, COVID 
has stymied, stopped any writing. I, 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 I write in my journal. That's probably the most writing that I do now. And uh, I've scribbled a few things here and there. I don't have the headspace uh, right now to, to, to create. So I found another outlet, which is a visual outlet. I was going to say, you've been doing your visual thing. It's yeah. interesting, though, because I think, I mean, obviously, we, we have friends in, you know, familiar, familiar circles, people like Nikki. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, our, our conversations throughout the COVID time with everything that everyone's, it's like, there's no bandwidth. There's no bandwidth. Where can you go? Where can you go to get a bit of extra? You know, it's like, it's yeah. like we want to plug ourselves into something that's going to give us a little bit of something. And that, yeah, that's the visual stories and, and my collages that I've been done a series of collages because with the collage, I can strip up paper, cut up stuff, stick things together to create an image. And it's, I actually don't think about anything else but the paper in front of me so and the image I'm creating. So that's your, I'm going to call it creative cathartic work, I guess. Yeah. It's giving you the feels of what you need to feel without taking from your brain power that for whatever reason you just don't seem to have. I don't have, but I can teach it though. If I yeah. did the, the, the workshop, the, 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 it's a split side because the split side of me, the workshops grew out of my being um, <coughs> blessed enough to attend workshops in the States. It's, what, it's a series called the Hurston Wright Writers Week. And at, when they first started, they were at Howard University. So London, Caribbean get to Howard University, African American college with the historical college, mind blown. Yeah. Culture, writing in a different space, meeting people who looked at me like, you sound so different. <laughs> you know, and it's I having to explain. Yeah. But yeah. coming away knowing that my story was valid. That was where. And then I realized, you know what? If I produce workshops because I believe that everyone's story is valid. Absolutely. I do not believe in the academic approach to writing. It has its place. Yes. I, did, I did an MA in writing for myself really. Yeah. But for me the storytelling everyone can do it. So when I do the I'm um, sorry my approach for the workshop was you know what I want to give this knowledge to people in a way because I benefited from this knowledge. I want to share it. Absolutely. And I, and I learn from the sharing and I learn, and you learn, I learn, you learn, I learn. Absolutely. And I find that as that is my authentic space is when I stand in that just right teaching space. Yeah, sharing. Sharing my knowledge. It doesn't belong to me. No. And well, if I'd had this, if I had this before, I might have done more. I might have done more, but maybe, when, maybe this is where I need to be. It's feeding, it's feeding you to feed on though, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. You reach one, teach one. And I think it's that perpetuating of our, you know, because if I think about me and the work that I do and therapy, coaching, mentorship, whatever you want to call it, really, it's just about conversations and, and getting someone's story and where they're maybe stuck in the story or they've got a kink in the story and they need to find their way out. And we yeah. need, everyone's story is valid. And I think that's really important. That um, is the key. Yeah, and, and to listen in the way that we can have our hearts and our minds opened. I mean, this morning when I went out for my hike, I woke up and I was feeling a bit meh because they closed the corridor. So whenever this goes out, people will say, yeah, Antigua England closed the corridor because of the COVID thing. Yeah. Um, and I felt a bit meh because I was like, but I want to be back there. When am I going to get back there now? <laughs> so I was like, okay, just do what you do, Janice. So, you know, for me, that's hiking, moving my body. And whilst I was doing that, I was listening to Russell Brandt interviewing the Holocaust survivor, Dr. Oh, what's her name? Eager. And, you know, she was in Auschwitz at 16. And I was like walking and I'm listening to her and I'm like, wow, this woman's 94. She's absolutely inspired. And the question that he asked her that really, really hit me and made me stop was he asked her how it felt when Dr. Mengli chose her. And she wow. said, she said, well, it was really, it was really good. And I have this beautiful dress on that I still have that my dad had made me. And she was talking about the fact that it had two, 
I think she called them posies or something. It was obviously a really nice dress and she still had it despite being in Auschwitz. And he chose her because obviously she looked attractive and she had a nice dress on. So she said, I was really lucky that day. It was a really good day for me because he spotted me and he wanted me to dance for him. And because he wanted me to dance, I didn't die. Mm. And I just kind of like, I was kind of stuck literally mid walk thinking, wow, you know, to, to have the ability to separate yourself from your story enough to see the gift of it as well. And then equally to use your story and what you've learned, which really, that's what you're doing with your writing. That's what you're doing with your sharing. And I think, you know, inadvertently, I get to do that with different people. I get them to see the gift in the story, even though the story might be like, oh, God, it's a horror show right now. Do you know it's me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it really grounded me this morning to sort of think, what am I even complaining about? Yeah, I... I uh... I mean, it's, I mean, I've said I. I don't walk around saying I'm black, I'm black, I'm black, I'm black. You know, what I mean, I don't walk around <laughs> with a big sign. No. So the accept the, the the acceptance that is actually not my issue. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> Once I got that with the writing, you know, being told by a teacher that you you, you need to write what you know, you you know, basically you can't write. Yeah. You know, no. Teacher. It's really you know, it's really interesting. You should listen to the podcast because that was the other thing that she said was that when she came, she got to America and I think it would have been 1949, she said, and she couldn't really write because she hadn't really had that opportunity, but she was clearly smart and she started learning. And the things that she tells everybody now is write, 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 get all the pieces of paper that you possibly can because the pieces of paper in America and lots of other places equal the doors open and you won't be seen as that immigrant as this, mm. as this. you'll be seen potentially as your pieces of paper. And I, you know, the, the things that come from that, but you know, talking about identity, I then came back and my mum's German and my mum has held on to this thing about still all Germans are bad and they've done bad stuff. And I'm like, but that wasn't you, that's not your story. It's mm. part of your history. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, and so I'm sort of saying, oh, I was listening to this podcast, Mum, and then there's this little thing, oh, she's going to she's gonna do her guilt thing. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, you know, we've all got our stories that we can either attach the bad stuff to it or the good stuff to it. And, and your story is inspirational and full of good stuff. But it's also an acknowledgement of that there has been stuff that's not great. It's what you do with that, isn't it? It's what you do with it. And... I think part of what has um, kept a lot of us stuck as black people is that the story, our story has not been acknowledged. It has, not, it has been talked about, yeah. but it's never actually been, you know what? These people were enslaved. They were not slaves. Yeah. They were craftsmen, they were holy people, they were teachers, farmers, mothers, daughters, children, grandparents. They had culture, language, religion. All of that was stripped. So when I'm like, that is the part that no one wants to acknowledge publicly, that we took away these people's identity. That's why we're still seeking absolutely that's why we're still seeking at least and i'm not i'm not i'm not um, um, minimizing the jewish experience but at no. least the jewish experience they can hold on they it's I, it's recognized absolutely it's absolutely. recognized and you're like and i tell my students now and i, and I teach part-time i say look we were enslaved africa is not a place it is a continent yeah. made up of peoples languages, customs, religions, good, bad, and indifferent because we're human beings. Absolutely. So when you keep saying that we're African, yes, but now let's get specific. Because well, we can. Because we can. It's connecting to the individuality of those people and their space and their demographics and their geography, right? Yeah. And it took going to India for me to recognise that. Because I did the India thing where India... Is one place, one people, one. 
got to lucky yeah. I, I, it's, it's the United States of India. And I'm like, you know what? It's the same way we talk about Africa. It's the same way I think about, I, I thought about India. And I'm like, no, 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 you need to come, you, you need to check yourself, come back. So I, I'm not saying that the, yes, it is, we do have roots there. There is no if spots when you see people and you go, oh my God, I met a guy from um, Ghana who has a doppelganger here in Antigua. Right. And he said, I met him in, London, in England and he said, the amount of people that have asked him if he's from Antigua, because he's got, a, he's, this guy's his twin. Yeah. And the guy said, I've never been to the Caribbean. I know, you know, but I must have some kind of, because this, this guy's double. Yeah. So um, we know, we know, but it's because we were denied the knowing that we can't place ourselves. We have a kind of generic idea mm -hmm. and, it, and we're still not being taught all of it. I mean, I teach here in Antigua and the children do not learn anything specific. It's still being taught as the slave trade. You know, no, this is not the slave trade. Yeah. You know, these are people. This is not cattle or goats or, or, or gold. So I'm, I'm aware that we're having a longer conversation. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely fine. So because, you, because you're teaching, so that puts you in an awesome position mm -hmm. to open up that story to its truth and to educate, right? And that's what, yeah, that's all writing. Though. I mean, see, that was going back to the, the creative writing, how I, why it's so important. Because that is the importance. It opens you up. It allows you to stand in whatever it is that you want to stand in. And it's not about me liking or agreeing or thinking the same as you. It's just, it's validating who you are and how you see yourself and what questions, because writing, creative writing is about questioning yeah. and, 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 pre and presenting. And as I said, the you know, London Rocks is a slice. It is not the life of black British people. No. It's just a particular slice of a particular time and of a particular group. Yeah, and it's a great in, it's a great insight. I mean, this this has been a fabulous conversation. It's just made me think we're going to have to have another conversation. Of course, we are because there's things that we haven't even talked about of how we've worked together, shared together, and done stuff together. If you were going to give. Um, I don't know, a little, a little pointer if anyone's looking for a little bit of creative outflow pouring, whether, whether they've done any writing, journaling, creative board storytelling, what's the simplest place for someone to start that will potentially just give them a little bit of something, a little bit of nourishing what I call feeding yourself so that you can get some goodness? I think you have to... But well, actually, just do it. And then the, the thing about the social media, it has its good and its bad. Yeah. And the good part is that there are so many writers, writers, creative outlets that you can actually tap into, learn from, and when you're ready, send your work to. Because that's the, the release is the hardest part from all of us who are right. creatives. It is the release, there. putting it out. It's the scariest thing. It's like giving birth. You give birth to a child yeah. and that's it. What do I do? It's the same, <laughs> with, the same, with, the same with the writing and, and the artists. You know, you, because you're, you're, you're revealing, you're vulnerable, you're vulnerable. You're revealing a bit of yourself. And not everyone's going to like it. And, and some people will love it and can't even tell you why they love it. And, oh, okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You love it because you know me, or you love it because you like the story. You know, what is it? Absolutely. You know? <laughs> so. And for the ones that don't like us or don't like our work, it's just being okay with that, isn't it? And I think that's the biggest learning that age brings is, you know, well, that's okay. And it's okay. It's okay to think, to, to acknowledge that every, you know, you're not for everyone. Because it's, it's not, the, not, an, not accepting that is when you get stuck. Yeah. And focus on the one person that says, I think you're right, it's terrible. <laughs> so, you know, but you know, you got, yeah. Care of that. It's, um, it's been an awesome conversation. Um, if you give me your details now so everybody can listen to it for the conversation, but we're going to make sure in the footnotes that people know how to reach out to you, where they can see your book, your workbook that you have, and everything. But if you just share that, where they can go and check out your stuff, that would be great. 
Okay, I've got um, Instagram and uh, Facebook, uh, Just Right Antigua, Just Right Brenda Lee Brown on Facebook and Instagram. That's where I put posts, visual stories and bits about writing. Uh, my email address is Brenda Lee dot Brown with an E, very important, at yeah. gmail.com. Um, I, my book is available from Hansi Publications in the UK or Amazon. It's called London Rocks. Um, the Just Write Journal, which is now being re-edited for the fourth edition. Should have come out last year, but... Cool. <laughs> but that's coming out um, for the Just Write Writers Retreat, which is being held in March 26th to 28th at the Great House, Mercer's Creek here in Antigua. So I've got my first Writers Retreat weekend um, in about three years in, in, in March. I would, open. I, yeah. I would really like to think that I might be there for that. <laughs> it's a, it's going to be a weekend. They give me a fantastic package uh, and it's a space with space to write, to think, because I believe that um, writing is a, like, is a verb. <laughs> You've got to do it. It's a movement, it's, right? It's movement, but it's also internal. So writers, if ever you're thinking plotting, inspired by something, you know, you never stop. You never stop. So don't think that because you haven't written this 95,000 word great works that you haven't done anything. You're, you're still, you're still, you are still creating. And that's the less, the biggest lesson I've had to learn to let go is that there's no timeline. It's not infinite. It's not, it's not, it's not, not limited. It's infinite. So I, when my work comes out, it comes out and not get caught up in the, oh, but Janice has written 12 books in my, for my one. That's Janice's journey, it's not mine. <laughs> so get, on, get with I it. Think that, I think that's a great way to round off our conversation. It's been great to have you here. And any questions and everything that any people have after, they know how to get hold of you. But as I say, we'll make sure that everything is there for people to reach out to you. And oh. um, I'm just, I'm going to end the conversation by telling you I'm very jealous that you are in the warm and you can go walk by the sea and yeah, just enjoy that and be safe. Thank you. Same to you. I know that, you know, it's a different circumstance and I do give thanks in all the madness that is going on that I do have this, this 108 square mile space, Absolutely. you know, to, to, um, to breathe in. Yeah. St yeah. Stay safe. You can be free in. Thank you yeah. ever so much. Thank you. And take care of yourself. Cool. Okay. Talk soon. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.